Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me as usual, co-host, financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. You know, last week on the show, if you haven't heard it, go back and hear. We had a wonderful assortment of folks from all over the world talking about their markets, including this gentleman who had just a few minutes. And today we have a whole show. Let's say hello to Mr. Carl Dean. How are you, sir? Good, good. How are you? I'm glad to be here. That's for sure. It was great <laughs> having you on the summit this year. Absolutely. It was a tremendous experience. I couldn't say enough about it. I mean, I went in there with kind of a mindset of, I know everything about real estate and, you know, I'm kind of one of these top guys. And I came out of there saying, you know, I got a lot to learn. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's a very humbling experience. And I was extremely fortunate to have been there. Such good stuff. Getting around uh, other brains, you know, is Absolutely. great. I mean, and you guys are doing a great job here at American Real Estate Investments where you help people who are looking to find markets and properties. And, and because of that place that you sit, we talked a little bit about a couple of the markets you're in, but I, I'd rather start bigger today, Carl, and, and really talk about how do you decide a market makes sense for real estate investment. So, I mean, it's it's like anything in life, whether it's business, personal, whatever it is. You know, you, you think about working out every day and trying to develop a phenomenal physique. It's like you get to a platform where you kind of have a good foundation, but then it's like, okay, well, now how can we make it better? It's just chiseling away at the block. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of factors that are, you know, the majority factors that we look at going into a market. Uh, and if it kind of hits those boxes and there's additional factors that we kind of look at to just sweeten the deal. And as we get into a market, you know, just kind of tweak everything to make it as best as possible. So well, especially because you guys work in the single family market, and yes. that would be different than if we were looking at industrial property or agricultural property, Absolutely. lots of things we talked about on the summit. But bread and butter, real estate, single family homes make a ton of sense for a lot of people. And you guys have really developed kind of a methodology of market selection. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is just having a network and a team. You can't go into any market without a network and a team. You have to have strong people on the ground that you can trust. You got to have people that are good at what they're doing, and you can be able to leverage those people. Uh, so I definitely think that, you know, having a good team and a good system in place is, is key when you're trying to do any of this, especially entering into a market to develop multiple properties. Right. But you look at things like, you know, the important factors are the overall cost of living, you know, the age of the available assets and price per square foot, those type of things, taxes, insurance, HOAs, the things that you're going to have to kind of take out of the the formula to, to calculate your net. I mean, those are going to be large factors. Crime statistics. Are there, is there low crime in the area? Is there a lot of theft in the area? You know, you, you definitely want to get into areas where you don't have to put cages around your ACs. You know, there's, there's different things that you look for, but also, you know, a lot of job growth, migration of, of people coming there for work. And then not only that, but like types of jobs. Not necessarily oil related jobs is the best, is the best thing to focus on, but you look at stuff like tech growth and you look at financial services and non oil related manufacturing. Those kind of things are really what I look at as, as a large opportunity to kind of enter into that market. Yeah, such a good point because at the end of the day, your tenant is the one who gets up and goes to work for somebody else and earns enough money to pay the rent. And you want to look beyond just, well, I've got a tenant in my property to, how long is that person going to stay? Is the job stable? Is it migratory workers or is it a stable industry? And then multiple industries. So I think you hit on some critical things. A lot of investors get excited when there is a temporary need for housing. Mm. I mean, think about what happened in the Bakken and people are like, oh, there's not enough houses. People are sleeping in cars. If yeah. there's, they can, there's not enough cars. Well, we looked at that and said, well, okay, that's one reason you might want to invest there. What's, what about long term? Is, is that a long term play? It turns out it wasn't. We elected to sit out that market. And I think in hindsight, that was the right decision. A lot of folks there are upside down now because they wouldn't build that. If we build it, they will come based on a single driver. So when you mentioned non-oil jobs, we've just been through watching oil, you know, head down and down and down to the point where it's you can't even pull it out of the ground for that. And that's going to affect certain jobs. But back to your point, you want to look at the durability of the industry your tenants employed in. Absolutely. So going back to the, the oil related jobs, I mean, you look at Texas, for instance, just to, just to name one market. And for years now, they've been giving the corporate tax cuts for other companies to come here. And they've strategically done that to try to pad themselves, knowing that at some point in time, oil is going to go down or it is a cyclical process no matter what or how, how you look at it. Uh, and so they've been giving a lot of tax credits and a lot of tax cuts to big companies that want to move people here. Well, obviously, there's a lot of California companies that would like lower overhead costs and stuff like that. So there's been a lot of not only millennial job growth, but also a lot of different corporates that are coming here. And uh, that's that's a large factor for us. When you look at stuff like that, they have a lot of infrastructure. They have a lot of R&D. And so when they come, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like a, a light like goes off in your head. You're like, well, there's got to be a reason for that. No, for sure. If you follow what big businesses do, rarely 
rarely do they just say, you know, let's go to this state. Yeah. I mean, they are very strategic. They're yeah, looking at yeah. the infrastructure. They're looking at where the labor pool is. And we come along as real estate investors and say, wow, if a big company or big industry is willing to invest in that area, I bet those folks are going to need houses, places to live. Now, let's couple to that the fact that today home ownership is the lowest it's been in a long, long time. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, for instance, I, I don't own any personal residence. I still rent. And I do that because, you know, I call myself kind of a real estate surfer. So I, I'm very experienced in what I do. And so I don't mind chasing markets. You know, I'm not married. I don't have kids. And so it's easy for me to say, hey, guys, this market's appreciation is kind of narrowing out. You know, let's look at some other opportunities. I'm willing to move and go set up shop and, and kind of build something in a new market. I've always been a person that doesn't kind of force people into a backyard type of situation. But, you know, Carl, that's a really good point because so many people invest where they live because yeah. it's what they know, right? I always say live where you want to live and invest where the numbers make sense. Yeah. And you really have taken that approach as a company. You have strategically gone into markets because the market has made sense, not because either you live there or your employees live there or your yeah. team lives there. Yeah. So for, just to give you a good example of that, you know, two and a half years ago, we were in Michigan uh, and I was kind of wrapping up things and I seen opportunities in other markets. And so I moved to Kansas City and started kind of focusing on that market to get my wheels uh, and then now we're in Dallas. And so we moved the entire team of 15 people down to Dallas, Fort Worth in uh, January of 2015. And it's just been, you know, it's one of those things where you get a lot of people who believe in what we're doing and they can see the value in it. And uh, it's not hard to kind of coax them into coming. I mean, we had guys come from New Jersey, California. And so you see opportunity. You see people that are willing to take that opportunity and stand by you as a company and what you represent. That's a really powerful thing. Well, and, you know, if you've got a headquarters somewhere, right, here's yeah. a state that's very business friendly, very yeah. tax friendly, those kinds of things. You know, one of the things you started off with was just kind of the cost to do, if you will. What's the mm -hmm. properties you can acquire? What does the cost basis look like and so forth? You know, if you look at a market like California, New Jersey, those are generally higher priced markets. And, and why Texas has gone up in value over the last 10 years or so, uh, it's still overall a, a very value rich marketplace to be in. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you think about, you know, the Fortune 500 companies, for instance. So, you know, Dallas Fort Worth grew to the fourth largest metroplex over the last year, surpassing Houston. And uh, you look at Texas overall or Dallas Fort Worth overall. And as far as the major metroplexes, you know, we have the, I think it's the fourth largest uh, population of Fortune 500 companies. And so when you look at the people who are ahead of us, you look at Chicago, you look at New York, you look at California, and then you compare apples to apples and see that our cost of living, our taxes and our home values, price per square foot is significantly less. And so there's an opportunity there because you have an influx of a massive amount of jobs of stable companies and, you know, the cost of living is great. So when you can sell a house that's 4,000 square feet under $200,000, that's built in 2010, your, your light bulb kind of goes off there and you say, well, that's a pretty good product. Now, you guys are in a lot of markets. We'll talk about yeah. many of them before we're done. But since we're talking uh, about Dallas, the other, I think, misnomer people have is they think it's all about oil in Dallas, but it's mm. not. There is a diversity of industry. And in any marketplace, one of the things we urge people to look at is what we call sustainable drivers, reasons that people want to live or work in a marketplace. And this market is a lot deeper, uh, no pun intended, than just oil. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's You got Facebook building an R&D department in North Fort Worth that's supposed to be a billion-dollar facility taking up a large piece of land. Uh, you, everybody I meet, you know, I'm a millennial. I'm 31 years old. My, all my all my partners and people who work with us here, they're all in the range of 25 to 35 year old guys for the most part, or, or women at, at the same time. And you meet everybody. So when we all came to the market, we were all new millennials. And so we're asking questions, we're seeing cranes, we're seeing things be built. And so I'm, I'm always asking people in the hallways of my apartment when I first moved down, hey, where are you from? Hey, what are you doing? And every single person I met, nine out of 10 people were not from here. They had moved here for some type of job. And it was amazing that I'd never heard, oh, I moved here for an oil related job. It was, I moved here for a drafting company or a design company or a marketing company. It just, there's so much opportunity. And when you, when you're a young company, and obviously we live in a, an age where startups are a huge thing, and there's a lot of smart people taking advantage of the tech stuff, there's a lot of opportunity here as far as cost of living, keeping your overhead low for a young company. And so not only are the large companies coming here to save money, but the younger companies are coming here to help them grow and scale without having to spend a lot of overhead. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, there's certainly are oil primary markets, oh, you know, absolutely. Midland, Odessa and places like that. But Dallas is much more diverse. And yet still, there's that underpinning of oil related industry, which isn't bad long term. Those jobs are hard to move, right? Yeah. And that's one of the things we look at. We talk about companies moving to 
Texas because of the economy and because of the business-friendly nature of the market. Uh, and other markets are losing companies and people because yep. of the opposite. So if we're studying markets, we want to know where people are going. Where's the puck headed? Absolutely. And there's, there's, there's a lot of ways you can track that, you know, and it's best to think outside the box. And so for one of our things is we say, hey, let's contact someone who's a high up at U-Haul, which a buddy of mine has a friend. And I say, hey, where's all the U-Hauls going? You know, there's a lot more U-Hauls coming into Texas from California and these, these high dollar markets than there is really anywhere else. And so you look at those things and those, those might not be things that a lot of people look at, but those are things when you get in this business and you're kind of seasoned, you kind of say, well, let's look outside the box. Let's yeah. try to really figure out who's moving where and let's get some real hardcore facts and data on that. That's awesome. We call that a, a clue. You know, the whole, yeah. if you look at the one way rental rates, right? And it's drastic. And yet that you're right. That's something most people aren't going to do. As a real estate investor, you may be very hands-on or you may be very hands-off. A lot of folks listen to our show. It's an hour a week. It's not their whole vocation. They own a few properties. They want to own a few more. What they're looking for is someone who has come before them to figure this stuff out. Mm, what yeah. we appreciate about what you guys are doing is that you've done a lot of the market research, but then once you get into a market, like say you pick Dallas, Dallas is huge, right? Yeah. Millions and millions of people in the Metroplex. So within that, what we're looking for is a sub market that makes sense. So once you find a market that makes sense, how do you find the neighborhoods? Yeah. So, I mean, just to touch on the first thing you said there, as far as you look for someone who has experience, you look for someone who has some credibility. I think what sets us apart is I started swinging a hammer and then I started managing crews and then I started the property management and then I started the investment side of the business and the brokerage side. And so I've been through every tier of the business. So I'm able to kind of help everyone around me. But you know, when you go into a new market, it's good to have that diverse knowledge so then everyone you meet, you can kind of educate them. You're not waiting on the contractor to educate you on what the code is and what, you know, I have a good knowledge of that stuff. I have a good background so I know who to talk to and exactly what to talk to them about. But, you know, when it comes to submarkets, you look at a lot of different things. You look at cost of living, you look at the price of the homes, and you look at the taxes. That's the major things. And then you look at some things like, you know, is this a millennial growth neighborhood where there's a lot of millennials here? Then we, maybe we should try to focus on areas that have good elementary schools or good middle schools because they're going to have young children. Uh, or is it a neighborhood that's a little bit more developed, a little bit, you know, more owner occupants, and we have just some good assets kind of trickled in or peppered in there. And we look at, you know, better high schools, you know, because we, we try to figure out who's moving into these places and how can we better serve them. Well, and the tenants, uh, if they find a neighborhood that they love, especially in single family homes, they'll stay longer, right? Apartment oh, dwellers tend to move more often than people that rent houses. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for the long term, one of the things, you know, obviously you guys have your thumb on the pulse of is the millennial renter. Mm -hmm. And I think you're not an exception in that regard and that you tend to be flexible and still rent. We see a lot of of millennials who don't view the American dream as owning a home yeah. just yet, which makes them great tenants. Yeah, the, the idea really is to create the assets and, and not a, a liability instantly. You know, just like Robert Kiyosaki says, you want to make sure that you have some good assets that can possibly offset the expenses of your liability that you choose to live in. A liability obviously referencing a home. And so, you know, when you go into some of these markets, it's it's very important to know that you could be leaving, you could be moving. But me, myself, I look at it like convenience. I mean, everything in the world is based around convenience. How much more convenient can we make it for the tenant? How much more convenient can we make it for them in any way? So we try to make sure that the homes are close to the schools. They're close to a lot of the, the grocery stores, things like that. You know, we want to make sure that the process is super convenient and that they take pride in the asset. It's definitely, there's a lot to it when it comes to really focusing in on what type of tenants you want. You know, the corporate relocation tenant for us is a great tenant. They're a tenant that they pay a little bit more for the rent. They want a nicer place to live. They probably own a home from wherever they're from after having to relocate. And so they have a little bit more care for the home. And so in turn, I try to do a little bit more on the rehab side because I want them to take pride in where they live and not feel like they live in a rental property. You know, me, myself, going back to the convenience thing, again, I'm renting right now. Uh, I rented last year. Although I moved, I, I probably will stay in my rental property that I have now. It's, I'm in a house uh, for a couple of years. And just because it's convenient, my office is here. I got a lot of things going on. I'm building my assets. And so why move? Why well, have to deal with the headache of moving and, and trying to deal with all that? It's just like, I want to be able to get up and go at any given time because that's the opportunity. And when, when you can act fast in an opportunity and take those risks, because in, in your, I guess in your profession, they may not be risks.
you know, in my profession, I'm very good at what I do with the real estate. So if I see an opportunity, I can jump on it very quickly. And that's kind of what separates me from a lot of the people who are piddle paddling around with real estate or, or might be considering a deal. You know, I jump on it quick and I can realize it. Our guest today is Carl Dean, Managing Director of American Real Estate Investments. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the other markets that he and his team are in and also how you pick the right property that's got a tenant ready to go, the turnkey nature of it. We're also going to play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. We're talking with Carl Dean about markets, how you pick a great market, and of course, how you pick a property. Carl, before we get specifically into the properties, let's talk about some of the other markets that you guys are in, because obviously strong, not only in Dallas, but other Texas markets as well. Let's first talk about the Texas markets that you've selected and why those make sense. Yeah, so, I mean, the Texas markets are very similar. The demographics are very similar between the tenants and the job growth. Um, San Antonio has also been leading the race when it comes to a lot of millennial migration. And so obviously Houston, even though the oil's down, it's still a large, large, large part of the community. And so these are our assets that we choose to purchase that are what we call our A-class assets. And that is because there is so much corporate relocation and there is so many good jobs coming here that you don't have to really deal with some of the lower end tenants that could be a headache. And, and I'm not saying that they all are, but you know, one thing I've learned over doing you know, over a thousand assets across the United States is... I prefer to deal with people who are just easier on me. <laughs> you know, this is a great, great point because just like you pick a market and markets have personalities, Russ talked about at the beginning of the show, understanding your customer, who your client is and, and showing up a certain way, if you will. And properties that are just a little above mean and mm -hmm. maybe have that A kind of uh, tenant, they're going to charge a little more. Mm -hmm. The performance from a percentage may not look as attractive, but at the end of the day, you're not up at night worrying about the property or the person living in it. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's a really popular product with a lot of the people who are rolling over IRAs and doing the solo 401k rollovers. They come to us a lot. I mean, that's, that's been, we've had a serious influx of, of people coming to us that are kind of coming from that demographic and they want to purchase something that's safe. They don't want to roll over their 401k and put it at risk by trying to flip a home or buy a lower class C class asset, as I would call it. You know, we look at those things and say, how can we make sure that we service them and give them the best possible asset that's going to be super, super passive, uh, something that they're not going to get calls on. And, you know, there's a number of ways we do that. So number one is we make sure that we're buying the higher tier assets. You know, when you have a 1200 minimum rent bar set for your A-class assets, that's a pretty big security deposit. And, you know, you're dealing with someone who really likes to take care of the home because the finishes are really nice. So they take a lot of pride in that. And they also want that big security deposit back at the end of their stay. Yeah. You know, our average tenant stay down here is about, th about three years. Uh, and we're pretty much 95% occupied at any given time because there's almost a waiting list for any of our properties that go on the market. We've become well known with some of the property managers as far as providing assets that are super quality. Uh, and so that's something that we really love to offer to the IRA clients. And, you know, it's a very passive asset. Like you said, it's a, it's a little bit lower cap rate when it comes to the net cap rate, but it's something that's warranted for the first year. We make sure we stand by our investors. We want to see them succeed. And so Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, they all are, are fairly same as far as the price points, as far as the quality of tenants, as far as the people that are living in them. There's a lot of millennials, small families. And so it's a very easy target for us to hit. And it's something that we believe in. It's extremely passive. You know, I always say to myself, is this something I would buy in mind holding? Or is this something I would sell to my mom with a smile on my face, knowing I'm doing the right thing? And I, and I can definitely say in this Texas market in particular, this is something I could sell to anybody with a smile on my face and feel confident and excited for them when it comes to year one or year two and they can look back at kind of some of the positive equity they've even grown. So even though that cash flow is a little bit less, you know, this is a fast growing market. Everywhere you look, there's cranes, there's development, there's job growth. There's regardless of the oil, Dallas Fort Worth, for instance, is still having positive job growth. And so, you know, there's going to be appreciation there that even though it's a cherry on top, it's a pretty good cherry on top. Such a good point, because when you look at any of the Texas markets, that's what's been attracting people to come live here. Those folks who are going to be your tenants mm -hmm. is jobs and yep. job growth. And that continues to happen. But something has changed in Dallas from when we first started looking at this market 20 years ago, 
Houses never went up in value. You yeah. bought a house for forty two five and ten years later it was worth forty three six. You know, you didn't see appreciation. But my goodness, in the last five years this market has appreciated. Yeah, and I mean you you look at it, it's like I said, back to you know, the startup thing. It's so many different people taking advantage of the opportunities on Google and on the internet and, and all these different th classes and seminars they can take. For instance, that you know, your guys' summit at sea. People go to these things and they get ideas and they want to start companies and where do they want to do it? The low cost of living. And so yeah, those are great target areas for these for these clients and for these tenants. Another thing that's important to me is making sure that our rehabs are, are up to par. I mean, I, if there's even a small, tiny paint drip where it shouldn't be, it's something that I, I nick my guys on. And I'm very hands-on when it comes to you know maintaining the quality across all markets with the rehabs, because when you maintain that quality, that person living in the home is going to take that much more pride in living there. Well, I tell you what, we've had a chance to go through a couple of your houses, yep. and we were very impressed with the fact that they look clean, tenant ready, very appealing. But once you've seen more than one, you guys have a very consistent yeah. look and feel, which is going to help the owner in terms of just maintenance and those kinds of things. Yeah, it, it helps them stick to the numbers. So, you know, my thing is, is and, and I said this a lot when I first got in the business, is because I had to learn this lesson myself the hard way, is don't get too attached to a property. You know, it's it's a widget. It's a way you can make money. But when you get looking at a property like what I live here, what, you know, what you know, now granted, that's not a bad question to ask because I asked myself that question. But at the same time, you can't get too hung up on that. And so that's why we've really streamlined the product as far as the rehab making sure it's consistent across the board. So if you've seen one, you've seen all. And so I always say, when you guys come in for a tour, see one short one and one tall one. Obviously, that means one ranch and one <laughs> colonial, because after that, you've seen every single property we own. And so then it's just looking at the numbers, looking at the demographics, the school districts, and, and deciding on an asset. It keeps it a lot easier to keep the the small details out of the buyer's head. It's like, well, they all look exactly the same. Every paint color, every carpet color, every single t solitary sink or faucet or switch or co light cover. I mean. It, down to the very small details. You know what I love about that is people get all caught up when they're looking for a house they want to buy yeah. that they're going to live in, right? And they're waiting for that right one. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've probably all known people that have waited two years to find just the right house. And that's fine when it comes to moving into a home you're going to buy. But as a landlord, it really doesn't matter that much. And beginning investors will him and ha, and they want to see more houses. The seasoned investor, the person that comes by for their fifth or sixth or seventh single mm -hmm. family house is like, well, just give me a good one. But yeah. they get that. And it does take some time to get your mind around that. We are conditioned as consumers to contrast and compare. And we want to do that on the market level. But again, in the real estate guys world, once you get down to the property, as long as it's in a solid neighborhood and you feel good about the long-term viability of the tenant base, Let's not spend a lot of time on that part. Let's get yeah. one and focus on how we're going to get the next one. Now, Carl, let's talk about some of the other markets you're in outside of Texas because Texas is great as it is, and there's lots of reasons why folks are looking to invest here. Uh, it may not always be that way, and there's other markets that look good as well. So talk about some of the other markets you guys are in. Yeah, so I you know, I started in Detroit, which is a very, very hard market to navigate. And I always tell anybody, if you can succeed in Detroit and do 500 properties in Detroit and manage the security and manage the property, man, I mean, there's nowhere in the That's U.S. Off, you right? can't yeah. succeed, you know. It's a very, very tough market to navigate, especially the inner city. And so I got my wheels there. And after that, I was just kind of like, what is an easier market to navigate? And any so market. I, yeah, any market. <laughs> exactly. So I went down to, you know, we started in Indianapolis, which because it was close, it was a nice blue collar economy. And so you know, it seemed to have lower crime in a lot of areas. There seemed to be a lot of pockets that seemed to make sense. And there was a great property manager there. And so we went and I met with the contractors and I hired some guys and, you know, we got them up and running with the system and how we want things done. And it, it takes a, some tweaking the first couple of months, but, you know, they get the hang of it. And over, I'm not a hire and fire guy. I'm not a, hey, you did it wrong. I'll see you later. I'm a, hey, you did it wrong. This is how you do it right. Let's keep improving so I don't have to go through, you know, turning over contractors. I like yeah. to stay loyal to my people. That's another thing. Strengthen network strengthen your you're the people around you you have to be loyal to those people you have to educate them on what you really want and help them see the vision another one is st louis i mean st louis is a market i've been in for three or four years my partners have been in for 10 or 15 years and that is a market where i just felt like there was fairly small brick homes uh there was really low crime in a lot of the areas we we're investing in and also, I look at that as saying, you know, when I go to turn this home over, it's not going to cost me a lot. Uh, and also, the taxes are really low. And also, the crime is really low. And also, we have a great property manager. You know, so I look at all those things and I say, okay, well, let's continue to sell this market. Now, for a while, we were, we were going to start focusing on strictly Texas. But 
what we learned was there's a lot of people who we've been dealing with for a lot of years that want consistent product. We have brokers who sell 20 or 30 homes of ours every month. And so those guys, you know, you, you're not going to turn away that business. Now, we have turned away business from guys that we sold 200 properties to in a year because they wanted more of a C-class asset that I feel is a little uncontrollable on the property management side, just on a large scale. Yep. If you live in the neighborhood, you're familiar with the neighborhood, it's something that you can manage. But Overall, you know, the St. Louis market is just a market where I feel like we have a lot of strength. We have a lot of good people on the ground. There's low taxes. And again, now it's jumping right back on Forbes radar and saying that there's a lot of tech growth. It's the number one most affordable housing market for college graduates with opportunities for jobs, even beating Houston and uh, Dallas. And so when you look at that, you're like, okay, there's something there. So instead of just doing five or 10 or 15 a month, okay, maybe it's time to ramp up. And so we kind of, we, we move our chips around. You know, the oil starts to get a little bit of a worry or a concern in Houston. Maybe we put more chips over in San Antonio. We send more money to the auctions in San Antonio and less in, in Houston because a lot of the uneducated investors are going to back off. And so we have a lot more opportunity on the MLS. Uh, same thing with St. Louis. It's just a great market with a lot of millennial growth, which is something that, you know, even though we've been there for several years, it's got us now scaling up dramatically and signing contracts and bringing new companies in to broker out of that market, which, you know, it's it's just a good housing market for us all around. It hits all of our triggers. I also think that it gives you a good compared to what and your team, because you're comparing markets in different places and mm -hmm. you can see what appeals to different investors. No two investors are alike. No two real estate markets are alike. Yeah. It, it gives us a, a a variety of different products. You know, it's it's one person really wants a safe passive asset because they're buying out of their IRA, or one person maybe only has twenty or thirty thousand dollars and they'd like to finance something that gives them a little bit better cash flow. I, I, that makes sense to me. As long as there's that that barrier between that B and what I call a C asset, which is in my mind about an eight fifty rent. You know, we don't do a lot of Section Eight stuff just because of you know I don't like dealing with bureaucratic systems in the government. But there's that tier, and as long as you stay above that eight fifty tier in my mind, you get a better quality tenant. It. And uh, St. Louis, we get a lot of thousand, uh, thousand fifty, eleven hundred dollar rents. And to me, that's that's a great rental range to where you're going to get a pretty solid tenant in there. So yeah. You know, Carl, one of the things people have to look at today is competition when they're out looking for properties, oh, yeah. right? We've seen all the hedge funds come through, and we've seen when there's a market that's strong, there's a lot of demand. But you sit in an interesting seat. Because of your volume, you're able to get properties that the average person's not. And of course, because of your model, which is to provide those to investors, that lets them kind of sit on your side of the table. What does it take to get inventory when a market's strong? Well, it's again, strengthen your network. So a little trick that I teach a lot of guys uh, when they're starting out, this is something that I did that made me extremely successful. So when I was in the Michigan market, when I got out of Detroit and actually started doing higher end assets, I started doing my real estate brokerage. I would give up my commissions and to all the other agents. I would research all of the agents who were selling all the assets that I wanted to buy, you know, the price ranges, the, the locations. And I would reach out to them and say, hey, listen, I'm a buyer. I'm a broker. I'm very, very serious about buying. I have the cash and I will come out to this property within five minutes of you posting it if you just let me know and I'll shoot out there and you can act as my buyer's agent. You, I don't need the 3% commission right. because I'm running the numbers on the house. And so what that does is it creates a massive amount of people as you build that network that send everything to you first because they already know in their head they can represent you and make double the money. So that's kind of a little trick that I teach a lot of guys going into a market trying to get more stock. Is why I go stock is what I call homes. But uh, And then also, you know, we're always on the auctions. We're always doing mailing lists for short sales. You know, there's, there's 100 different avenues, but, you know, I can't say one is better than the other. But what I can say is when you have a strong network of, of wholesalers and real estate and agents around you that get the investment side of it and you kind of give them that extra cookie on the side then it and it helps you know it just helps deal flow it helps a lot of a lot of people try to you know send you deals and they know who you are and they ask you to come to their events and meet more people and it just you know it's in the network again good stuff well there's a lot involved with picking a market and picking a winner when it comes to a property and we talked about a lot of things today we've asked carl to put those thoughts together in a quick report on how you can pick the right market and pick a winner if you'd like to get a copy of that all you have to do is send an email to winner at realestateguysradio.com winner at realestateguysradio.com well carl it's been great uh, catching up with you and uh, certainly great to have you on the summit and uh, two shows in a row that's uh, that be a yeah. record but uh but thanks for all of all of your great uh, expertise and uh, information today no i definitely appreciate it and that's you know, we're doing pretty well here i love you guys it's great to be it's great to be a part of your guys's association and your your group of uh, very intelligent people <laughs> all right well keep up the good work more when we come back you're tuned to the real estate guys radio program i'm your host robert helms 
Hi, this is Peter Schiff, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Oh, my goodness, just a wealth of knowledge from Mr. Carl Dean. Yeah, there was a lot of really good stuff in there, so I'm really happy that he's putting it together in a report because hopefully people were listening to this and taking notes. As is my style, I have about two pages of notes. And, you know, the thing he closed on, I thought, was just so powerful. We talk about this all the time, but it's easy to miss. Real estate has become hot again, right? We went through the trough where, you know, it was just you could buy anything you wanted. It was super cheap because real estate was a pariah. Nobody wanted it. Now it's hot. You know, I read reports how home equities come back and, you know, there's all these renters out there. And, of course, we know in in the apartment space, cap rates are squeezed. But in the residential space, all the hedge funds coming in. So this is something we We've watched evolve. But, you know, he talked about, well, how do you compete in in a market like that? And he goes, well, I give something more to the guy that is controlling the inventory because I don't need the 3% to have my deal make sense. I can't tell you how many people are out there trying to make their deal make sense by squeezing providers, by squeezing real estate agents. And they just don't realize, you know, when they're doing that or on the flip side, right, they go to sell the inventory if they're flipping a property and they're like, you know, I'm not going to pay as much commission. I'm going to, and they shoot themselves in the foot. And people who don't understand the way the business works, don't understand, you just put yourself at the end of the line. He must've said three or four times, strengthen your network, strengthen your network, strengthen your network. This is a people business. And if everybody doesn't eat, if you don't make it worth it to everybody, if everybody doesn't doesn't get what they need out of the deal, you're not going to get deals. Yeah, absolutely. You're looking for any advantage you can get. So you could come into a market that Carl and his team are in and try to compete with them for inventory, or you can come alongside saying, here's a group that spent 10 years getting these relationships to be able to get this inventory, and they know where the bodies are buried. They know how to rehab their property. It just makes such better sense. But that's a mindset. People think, well, I could do it myself. I could save that commission. I could save the money on the paint, all those things. You're majoring in the minors. It depends on who you are. I'm not saying you can't roll up your sleeves and get work done. There's people that listen to the show. That's what they do. They rehab houses and they make that spread. Most people, however, are so busy with the rest of their lives, the last thing they need to be doing is spending their weekends fixing up houses or bidding and losing, which can be completely frustrating. Instead, when you can come along someone who's doing it's our whole idea about the Federal Reserve, right? It doesn't matter whether you like what they're doing or not. If you can see what they're doing and learn, you can come alongside and invest in a way that makes sense. Same thing when it comes to someone who has earned their stripes in the real estate business. Well, I mean, there's a mentality there in coming back to this notion of it to me it's scarcity versus abundance if you have a scarcity mentality scarcity breeds scarcity and so if you don't have enough deal flow you probably got scarcity if you don't have enough cash flow you probably got scarcity he talked about being loyal to his contractors he made a big deal about that hey if you make a mistake I'm gonna train you I mean if the guy's a bad person they're they're not honest of course that also somebody who's dishonest or steals that scarcity mentality right there's not gonna be enough therefore I have to take what I can and take my risk you see this all the time But what I was picking up as I was listening to Carl, I was getting greater insight into his mentality in terms of how he actually does business. You know, instinctively, as I've gotten to know him, like, I really like this guy. I like the way he operates. I just really like it. But now as I'm listening to explain his business philosophy, I'm like, okay, now I understand why. He sees the big picture. He thinks in abundance. He wants to train. He creates win-win. He's concerned about the asset, the neighborhood. He wants to attract the right demographic. You know, I don't want to get involved in Section 8. It's brain damage, you know, I'll do it, but I don't want to, you know, and and the idea that really looking out for the people that are coming in with their IRA money, he said that two or three times too, which I thought was really powerful. Again, it's not just, hey, I'm not just trying to get in and out of this property, right? A lot of people in the real estate business are just about the transaction. Let me just get in, let me get out, let me make my profit on to the next thing. This is more about the relationship. This is more about taking care of people and building a brand, building a a reputation. And when he said strengthen your network and he talked about how he does that, practical tips, I thought that was gold. Well, it's what Jim Rohn would call enlightened self-interest. If they do a great job for you as a real estate investor, you know what you're going to do? You're going to buy more. You're going to want more houses. A a single family owner occupant can really only occupy a house. I mean, they could have a weekend place, but they're going to have a house at a time. And, you know, the typical average person is going to have a new house every 4.7 years or whatever that looks like. An investor could buy a house a year or a house a month. And the idea of starting with taking care of those folks and thinking through that long term perspective just makes sense. And it's amazing to me how few people actually think that way. Well, the other thing he talked about taking care of was the tenant. Remember how we talked about convenience? 
I want to make it convenient for the tenant. I want to give them a home they're going to take pride in. Where does the cash flow come from? Exactly. You know, and, and you know, and 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 how many times did you talk about? I went into this market, and the key was great property management. I mean, we've been preaching that forever. So many people think of the property management last, right? They go buy the property and then hand a problem to a property manager and blame the property manager for for trying to fix a problem they created by buying the wrong property for the wrong demographic and then maybe not improving it properly for who they're trying to serve. I mean, so much wisdom. I, I I think you need to go back and listen to this show like three and four times, especially if you're on the front end of your career. This is a young guy that's got a thousand deals under his belt in multiple markets. I mean, there's guys that are twice his age that don't have the experience or the wisdom. So this was a great, great episode. And Carl's put a lot of that in his report. Ed, all you have to do to get a copy of that is send an email to winner at realestateguysradio.com. Winner at realestateguysradio.com. When you look at a market, you want to pick a winner. When you look at a property, you want to pick a winner but more importantly than that is a team make sure you're getting a team that you can rely on build that loyalty because that's a two-way street all right well big thanks to carl dean for taking time out of his busy schedule and sharing his wisdom with us if you'd like to hang out with carl then come to our field trip to dallas texas we're excited to have another field trip on the calendar all you have to do is go to the website at realestateguysradio.com under events you'll see we're going back to dallas texas yeehaw you can hang out with the real estate guys with carl dean you'll get to see a lot about the market and we'll look at some great properties as well. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen.